I have called tonight's talk the last best gasp of mechanical television, you will see why, later my presentation. My name is David and I will be talking for Professor Barker tonight. In 1934, J. H. Jeffrey, whose photo I have shown here, invented the so-called Jeffrey cell, which is a light modulator. Mr. Jeffrey was a prolific investigator in many fields, but concentrated on optics. Here I have shown a photo of what is thought to be the last remaining Jeffrey cell from the mechanical TV era. It is filled with kerosene and relies upon the diffraction of light due to compression waves within the cell. I will attempt to explain its operation later in my talk. The main advantage of this cell is that it is effectively a light storage device. I will explain this later. Suffice it to say, that a light storage principle provides at least a 50-fold increase in picture brightness compared to other techniques such as the Kerr cell that I mentioned in episode 2 of this series. In, 1 G.W. Walton was promoting a system of television that was still basically a mechanical system, but with improvements in terms of simplification and synchronizing. Here I show a diagram of Walton's invention, that he called a strixograph, that I obtained from a book published in Paris. I have to admit that I do not understand exactly how this works, though it seems to be a clever variation of the mirror screw system. He had collaborated with W.S. Stevenson, an inventor who was the model for the James Bond series of movies. At the time, they were both working at the General Radio Company in London. Walton called his company Scofany, now a Russian immigrant by the name of Sagwal enters the picture. Sagwal left Russia to escape the harsh Russian winters and the oppressive Soviet regime. He heard of Walton's ideas and struggled financially to form a company to develop Walton's ideas. Eventually he was able to incorporate and he joined with Walton and called their company Scofany. Here is a photo of the employees in 1936. Obviously, the company's fortunes had improved, as shown by the Rolls-Royce car in the right of the picture. Scofany produced three or four different models of television. Shown here is a top-of-the-line model. This model includes a radio as well. The second photo shows the interior of the set. Obviously this was a labor-intensive piece of equipment. Most of the top half of the cabinet is taken up with the mechanical scanning assembly. On the top left side are the sound and video receivers. At the bottom of the cabinet are the power supplies. On the next shelf is the electronics for driving the mirror drums. I estimate this television set would have weighed about 400 pounds. In this photo we see the layout of the mechanical assembly of the set. At the top is the slow speed frame scanner. In England the standard frame rate was 25 per second. With 12 mirrors, this drum rotates at only 125 RPM. Below it on the right hand side is the high speed or line scanner. This was a metal polygon, usually with 20 faces, rotating at more than 30,000 RPM. These motors had a life on only a few thousand hours and had to be periodically replaced. Here is another example of the Scofany line up. This one has a 2 feet by 1 and 1 half foot screen on a pull out screen to provide the required projection distance. According to one source, this set cost 220 guineas, roughly 250 pounds, or 1,200 Canadian dollars, in 1938. In other words, one half of a year's salary for a mid level engineer. That would be like spending more than $30,000 on a TV set. Still, I recently saw an advertisement for a deluxe turntable, for $30,000, so there is a market out there. Scofany also produced a theater version of the receiver. Here is a photo of the unit. Oddly, this unit looks very much like the Eta 4 large screen projector that was popular in the 1980s. I once saw one of these in use to display harbor radar in France. I might describe the Eta 4 device in a later talk. For those who don't know about it, the Scofany projector provided a real theatre experience. Here is a photo of a theatre in London with crowds waiting to enter. With all of this preamble, what makes the Scofany design unique? It's the clever use of the aforementioned Jeffrey cell. In this diagram you can see the essential elements of an light management system. 
From left to right, the essential elements are a high-pressure mercury lamp, a condenser lens to concentrate the light on the mask, a vertical mask to project a vertical beam of light onto the Jeffrey cell, a cylindrical lens, the ultrasonic Jeffrey cell, a cylindrical lens, a projection lens to project the image of the cell onto the screen, an aperture stop to block the direct beam of light, the high-speed scanner, 30,000 RPM, a cylindrical lens to form an image of the Jeffrey cell, of one line width. In this sketch I show the essential details of the Jeffrey cell. On the left is a quartz crystal being driven by a 10 MHz oscillator, the output of which is amplitude modulated by the incoming video signal. This sets up pressure waves in the container of kerosene. The dimensions of the cell are such that it takes one horizontal line time to travel the length of the cell. In the case of the British TV standard at the time, this was 98.8 microseconds. At the end of the cell is an absorbing material to avoid reflections and consequent standing waves. In my second sketch are shown the details of the optical system. For clarity I have omitted the cylindrical lenses. The aperture is flooded by light from the mercury lamp. Light spreads by refraction into the cell. When it encounters the kerosene, it is refracted by the pressure wave which exactly represent the incoming video. The image of the cell is projected onto the screen via a stop which blocks the direct beam of light from the aforementioned aperture. So, in the absence of any video, the screen will be dark. The problem is that a line image is moving from left to right at the speed of propagation in the kerosene. This brings us to my third sketch. This diagram, which again omits the lenses, shows the high-speed scanner rotating in a direction opposite to the movement of the pressure waves in the Jeffrey cell. This stabilizes the line and all that is then needed to form a complete picture is for the low-speed scanner to sweep the line from top to bottom of the screen. Earlier in this talk I had talked about light storage as being the primary advantage of the Scofany system. Of course, it is not light storage per se, but rather the fact of the whole TV line being displayed at once that accounts for the brightness of the picture. Compare this to a normal television screen phosphor that must necessarily have a short persistence to avoid smearing in the reproduced picture. So now you know about the Scofany mechanical television system. Unfortunately it came about when the World War stopped all television development, and just as CRT technology was being perfected, after the dissolution of his company, Solomon Sagal joined his son Joe in the USA where they continued to work in the television industry. That's all for tonight, gentlemen. My next talk will deal with the intermediate film method of television transmission, which was used extensively in Germany in the mid-1930s. Good night.